Hi, welcome to another episode of Talking with Docs. I'm Dr. Brad Weening. And I'm Dr. Paul Zalzal. How's it going, Paul? Thanks for taking my call. It's going great. What do you got going on today? Special guest, guest speaker to talk about a special topic today. Oh, is it a clinical epidemiologist to talk about COVID-19? Guess again. Oh, a microbiologist or infectious disease specialist to talk about COVID-19? Guess again. A barber to teach us how to cut our own hair? No, however, that would be a hot video, as would be how to touch up your ever-growing gray roots, which is a crisis out there right now for particularly a lot of women. Um, All right, well, what's the deal? Who's going to be joining us, and how am I going to edit three of us into one screen? I'll try and figure that out. I believe in you, Paul. So it's Dr. John Haverstock. We've had him on before talking about rotator cuff. Today, he's going to educate us about shoulder instability. Very common problem, but has actually some really cool solutions that can get people back to their normal lives. Did you say mental instability? <laughs> uh, I don't think Dr. Haverstock can fix that, but you know what? We can ask him. No, shoulder instability. Okay, that's cool, because this morning while I was combing my eyebrows, I thought we should have someone out here talking about something other than COVID-19, Corona, pandemic. Let's see if we can go the whole video without saying COVID-19, pandemic, or Corona. From this moment forward. From here on, don't say COVID-19. Okay, stop saying that. Okay, right. so let's get Dr. Haverstock on the phone. Uh, John, are you there? I can hear you. Great to Excellent. see you too. Thanks for obliging us with your uh, with your presence and your knowledge. I'm happy to be okay, here. Okay, Paul, do you want to start us off for shoulder instability? Yeah, doctor. Doctor. Thank you, doctor. doctor. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. So, yeah, tell us about shoulder instability. First of all, what's uh, what's the history? Like, if someone has shoulder instability, what are they going to present with? Yeah, um, so super common problem, and most often they're going to say, I dislocated my shoulder. That's the most common, although not always. Okay. And when we say dislocated right, shoulder, anything. what do we mean? What bones are we talking about? Yeah, so we're, we're talking about the, the ball of the shoulder, um, the humerus bone, slipping out, usually going in front of the socket, which we call the glenoid. So uh, usually happens when we've got our arms up. I'll try to move here, up overhead, kind of throwing position. That's the usual position uh, that it happens. And just for our viewers, okay, cool. we, we have a video that distinguishes shoulder separation or an AC joint injury versus a glenohumeral or a shoulder dislocation. So watch that video. That'll talk about that a little as well. Yes, we do. Okay, so that's a history. Someone feels that their shoulder dislocated or the ball came out of the socket. Uh, any other sort of presentation they could have instead of like a full-on dislocation? Yeah, sometimes it, it kind of partially goes out, which we call subluxation. And in that point, they might say, hey, I got shoved, I was playing sports, I fell, and it felt like something was off, and now I'm having pain, mostly when I reach overhead and backwards. Okay, so that's sort of the presentation of, an, of some shoulder instability. So when they come and see you, what do you do? Yeah, so the story is important, uh, and... And sometimes it's not that obvious, uh, but but most often it is. And and we want to do a physical exam, and we're doing some specific maneuvers, mostly just trying to reproduce. You know, when you go up and you bring your hand out, like that throwing position, does it give you some apprehension? That's the biggest thing that people feel, apprehension. So, John, when someone dislocates their shoulder, do they, they dislocate and then it pops right back in, and then they, they go home, and then they have dinner, and then they go to the doctor like the next day? Or how does it usually work, first time? Yeah, for most people, I think, you know, it goes out, it dislocates. It's a fairly traumatic, very painful thing, and they're holding their arm differently. They make their way to the hospital over the next, you know, hour, and hopefully within an hour or two, they've had some pain medication. It's been popped in or, or reduced, we call it, put back into joint, and things feel a whole lot better when okay. that happens. Uh, so most people get a sling at the hospital and then they might get follow up uh, with a clinic or their family doctor. And yeah, there's a lot of unknowns after that. Okay, so you've, they've come to see you and they've given you a history of a dislocation. They went to emergency room, had it put back in, or they have a history of it subluxing where it feels like it almost comes out and it feels unstable. And you've asked some more questions about it. We always start with a history before we do a physical exam and we ask about past medical health and all the rest of it. So you've done all that now, Dr. Haverstock, you're going to do a physical examination. What, what are the key features of the physical examination for someone with suspected shoulder instability? 
Yeah, so if it's been in the last two weeks, I don't wanna push their shoulder very much. I wanna I wanna talk and I wanna see their basic motion, make sure that they didn't have a nerve injury as well. The older we get, you know, and old for a shoulder dislocation is like over 30. Most of these people are under 20. So once we get older, there's a chance we're gonna have other things going on, like a subtle nerve injury where our deltoid muscle isn't working well, um, or perhaps a rotator cuff tear. So those are the first things I wanna check out, especially in a patient maybe over 30. Um, we wanna do an X-ray uh, because uh, that will sometimes show some damage to the bone. Um, and then I'd usually get them into physiotherapy after to give them some information about the basic early rehab. Okay, so now they're, they're into rehab, they probably have some pain in their shoulder. What is, the, what is the timeline, John, for things like this? Like, is this like a six week problem? Is it a six month problem? Do they do physio for a couple of weeks and then they never have to think about their shoulder again? You know, it's different for everyone. I think that uh, seeing a physiotherapist in the first two weeks is important. Usually I do one to two weeks of sling wear and get the motion going in like a safe, predictable spot where you know you can do a reach up in front, but you're not going up, to the out, up, up and out. Um, so some people bounce back over weeks and others, um, you know, they have some of that additional damage and they're never quite the same. So the younger you are, the more quickly you get back in action. And uh, there is a chance of recurrence. Okay. That could happen again. I'm just gonna jump back for a sec. So we did a history, we did our physical examination and we're thinking about starting some physiotherapy. Any investigations that we would order in terms of x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, ultrasounds, anything like that? So Paul, you weren't listening, you yeah. said an x-ray. <laughs> You said x-ray? Yes. Well, I said it, but but yeah, you know what? It's an important thing is that sometimes they don't take a certain x-ray view, and I always like to get a specific x-ray view that lets us see that socket or the glenoid really well because there can be some subtle injuries that get missed. But uh, x-ray is the standard. I don't go further than that no. unless I have a specific reason. I usually let the dust settle, so to speak, and that's all I'm gonna do in the first month or two. Oh, so not even an MRI uh, in the first month or two? That's right. Okay. All right. So we've gone to the, we're at the, we're at the physiotherapist now. And then when do you reassess them? Yeah. So uh, I would see them about maybe four to six weeks after uh, their injury, presuming that they're checking out normal and they've got that close contact with a good physiotherapist. Um, and so at that point, hopefully they're coming back. They don't have their sling on. Their motion is you know, approaching normal and they feel good about doing simple things around home. Okay, how long do you wait for, for sports or like a physical job? Yeah, so contact sports, it's gonna be longer. It's gonna be on the order of eight to 12 yeah. weeks depending on the circumstance. Yeah physical job, like I think if you're, you're, you know, physical with your hands in front of your body uh, and not so much overhead, I think as able. Um, and so the best person to make those decisions is usually the physiotherapist with the patient's input. Okay, and, and what, so we, you described a nice non-operative treatment plan for this and you did mention, you did touch on recurrence. Um, is there a role for surgery in this setting? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Surgery is, uh, is often helpful. Uh, there's kind of two schools of thought and one school is saying, hey, if they've had a dislocation in a certain age group, um, there's a t high chance of recurrence. Why don't we get in there and fix things up and prevent that s second dislocation? And then there's another school that says, well, there's a good number of people that are not gonna have a second dislocation for various reasons. So why don't we wait till they have that second or that third, that, that repetitive dislocation when they declare how their shoulder's gonna be. Okay, so, so if you got to the point where whether it was the second or the third or whatever, and you've decided that, hey, we need to fix this person's shoulder, what investigations do you get preoperatively and what exactly are you fixing? Like, how are you keeping it in place? Yeah, great question. So if we've got really good x-rays and the bones, the shape of the bones looks pretty normal, but we're still having the instability symptoms, I'm going to get ask for an MRI. And there's a couple MRIs. You can get a high resolution type MRI, which doesn't really need an injection necessarily. Or if your MRI is not top notch, an injection of dye into the shoulder can clear up the picture. And, and what we're looking for is we're looking for this little tissue at the front of the shoulder, it's called the labrum. And so here's my analogy, you know, imagine you have a golf ball and a golf tee, 
Um, that's the shape of the shoulder joint. The ball is big, the socket is not. And so if you rub the little bit edge off the socket, then the golf ball is just gonna keep on falling off time and again. Um, so we're looking at the front of the socket and there's a little bit of tissue that's like a bumper almost. It's like a, it's like a curb uh, that, that deepens the socket and provides that stability. So that's what we're really looking for are the bones uh, do they have a, a minor bit of wear, something subtle, or is that labrum, that bumper at the front of the shoulder disturbed? That's very okay, interesting, cool. John. So you, so you don't necessarily need an arthrogram. Is that what you're saying? I, I don't think I knew that. Yeah, cool. it's, it depends on you know, who's yeah. reading it and uh, how obvious the patient's symptoms are. But uh, with this new 3 Tesla, that's kind of like the HD version, they get a good view just by the joint fluid. So it's not, it's not wrong one way or another, um, but uh, I find with our really good quality MRI we have at our hospital, it's not necessary. Oh, yeah, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna clarify that to our viewers. So we're talking about an MRI versus an MR arthrogram. So magnetic resonance image versus a magnetic resonance arthrogram. The arthrogram is where you inject some dye into the joint. In this case, it's gadolinium. I believe, is that what they use, John, for the MRA? Yeah. And that shows up on the MRI, and that is going to help them see if there's a leak in the joint where there's a leak of fluid out to show that there may be a labral tear. However, the newer, more highly resolute MRIs can detect those leaks just using the inherent joint fluid that you have, and you don't need to inject anything into the joint. So you don't need the MR arthrogram. You can do it just with an MRI. Am I right on that? Absolutely, yeah. It just it depends on the, the quality of the MRI, and they're okay. they're changing all the time. Um, John, is, right, is this so operation you... done with a, a big cut or some small little poke holes, like a lot of surgery is done nowadays? Yeah, you're right. It's changed a lot over the years, and so the standard would be three little poke holes, you know, each over a centimeter. And basically, what we do is we free up that labrum, that bumper, from where it shifted to the uh, abnormal position. We free it up. We we put it back where it belongs. So it's kind of like, we call it anatomic. It makes it like it was before. That's the really nice part. There is some other operations that are possible, but this one is the, the, the standard and, uh, and, and it really does well. Cool. Okay, and what happens after that? What's the post-operative protocol after you've had a surgical uh, repair of your shoulder for instability? Yeah, so we really need, just need to protect. You know, that tissue takes about three months to mend in a solid fashion. So we want to protect that repair. We wear a sling, the patients wear a sling for six weeks, and they see the therapist a week or two afterwards and start to get their motion back. So it's really about preventing that big abnormal stress, you know, uh, getting, you know, knocked over, reaching for something and coming off balance. But it's about therapy, getting our motion back over the first six to 12 weeks, and then strengthening after 12 weeks and a return to sport, usually around six months approximately. John, I won't hold you to okay. the success rate, but is, is it a successful operation? Like how often do people dislocate again even after going through the operation? Yeah, it depends on a few factors like your age, the sport you play, are you like a loose jointed sure. person, um, and are the bones uh, perfectly shaped still? But in, in the average candidate, I would say the success rate is 85, 95% yeah. uh, won't have another dislocation again. Uh, but if you have a dent in the in the ball or a chip in the socket, if you're really stretchy or you play contact sports, your risk of recurrence uh, is not uh, not zero after the surgery. Right. Those are pretty good odds. Yeah. Um, okay, anything else, Dr. Haverstock? Anything else you'd want your patients to know or anyone to know about shoulder instability and its treatments? Yeah, I think that uh, it's important for people to know that if you let your shoulder go in and out like 20 times, and, and, and that does happen sometimes that uh, patients, you know, they just keep on saying, well, it's going in okay, it's not causing me too much trouble. That can potentially lead to arthritis. So it's best to have it checked into before you get into numerous dislocations because the operation is quite Like Mel Gibson in Lethal Weapon. Is that all Braveheart? No. No, no, yeah. He's, Ray Party Dr. Dr. Howard Stark's too young too. for that movie. I, I think they just cut I thought he got disemboweled. He got disemboweled in Braveheart. Yeah. Dis completely disemboweled. 
Um, God, and it, that's a great does, does age play a role here? I've been telling my patients that uh, when I see them, uh, 40 seems to be the magic number. If you're under 40, the chance of recurrence is a little higher than if you're over 40. Is that is that around the number that you use? That's that's a good rule. Yeah, absolutely. And and then it's higher yet for those people under 20 or under 16 type thing. But age does play a difference. It's one of those rare moments in life where it's better to be older than younger. <laughs> Very rare. Yeah, you got it. Okay, well, okay, hey, cool. so thank, is that just, oh, sorry, is that everything? Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask one more question. Uh, Dr. Weening, I noticed you're wearing a sweater. Yeah. Is that because you're cold or you did not have a chance to iron your shirt today? So I would say both, to be honest, because we had two snowstorms today, which I'm not mm -hmm. sure if you can believe, like whiteout conditions. So it's a combination yeah. of the two. And you know what? I figured I'd dial it up a little bit for you guys. You should, you should let your region know that it's April now. I know, mid-April too. And if you consider the polyester blends, ironing is not often required. Okay. Yeah, I think I've seen those. I've seen those. Um, so, hey, um, thank you so much, Dr. Hammerstock, for the amazing summary about shoulder instability. Um, and people, please, if you, if you like this video, please like it. Subscribe to our channel. Leave us a comment. And we went through the whole thing without saying COVID-19 or pandemic. Uh, you had to do it. Nice work. It. Until then. Yes. Until then. Dr. Hammerstock, thank you so much. And remember, you are in charge of your own health. See you next time.